Chaksu Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Padati Swa Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorgali Kachari Nini Rishesha Sunyavari Pasjat Yede Satarine Pancha Kalpa Turu Vishya Vipa Sindhu Devacha Gita Nam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaha Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Vakti Vrindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, so um, beginning today and for the next week, um, we are going to be uh, doing a little presentation on the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books, along with discussing some uh, philosophical teachings within the books. Um, this has been an ongoing concern of the general body of devotees. And this year, it came to a, a discussion where they're discussed, the leaders in our society during the uh, ISKCON leadership Sangha, which happened in February this year, uh, came up with some concerns that being presented to the general body of devotees. This has been something that has been building for many years. And basically, it centers around reading Srila Prabhupada's books. Um, reading Srila Prabhupada's books and hearing Prabhupada's lectures are not simply a feature of getting the edification, spiritual edification and knowledge that we require in our practice although that is the most important thing. But the, the essential point, which centers around that principle, is that to stay in contact with Srila Prabhupada and keep Prabhupada foremost in the center of everything that ISKCON presents. And that's how Prabhupada organized the society, his books, his lectures, his letters, his uh, morning walks, his room conversations, everything he did, he practically organized everything through these different forms of uh, outreach and media. So later that was all formulated and in, in how the society went on. Prabhupada didn't generally meet with, with leaders and discuss things. He mostly presented things in a general way, and then his devotees formulated his instructions into practical organizational programs. So one of the things that Prabhupada emphasized is the importance of reading his books um, to stay in contact with the philosophy, to have a working knowledge of the philosophy, to be able to represent Srila Prabhupada as a follower of Srila Prabhupada, um, not knowing or having very little knowledge in Prabhupada's presentation of the philosophy and the Shastras doesn't really qualify us to be a follower of Prabhupada. We have to kind of live according to what he taught and know what he taught and also know 
in a practical way how to apply it. Although our movement is a lot and is based on community, temples, and various types of yatras, still each and every individual is responsible to keep a uh, keep a working understanding of how Krishna consciousness works and how to apply the principles, how, what is Krishna, what is the spiritual world, what is our relationship with Krishna, what is this material world, what is our relationship with the material world, what is our uh, in different, different kinds of relationships with the material world. It's not just, uh, you know, like homogeneous. There are so many aspects to that relationship. And so uh, um, the GBC, with great concern, has, uh, has made this one week as they have done previously with the uh, with the holy name, which will be coming up on the 19th, I believe. There's a week of holy name week where devotees all around the world do Harinams and uh, Kirtan programs, Kirtan mailers, individual increases of one's chanting. Now it's this is the first year, and the concern is devotees don't read and study Prabhupada's books. So this week is dedicated to that. So in this first lecture, uh, before I go into a systematic presentation of a seminar that I have uh, ready to present starting tomorrow, I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the reasons why we don't read Prabhupada's books. Um, and we can uh, find that there are many, many reasons. Um, why don't we read Prabhupada's books? Well, there's a whole list of possible reasons. Some of them are more obvious, and some of them are some of the things we don't, we fall into. One is that we don't have time. We find that reading becomes shelved in face of other activities. In other words, if I have time, I'll read. If I don't have time, I don't read. Um, that do, is due to somewhat of a lack of an organize, organized daily schedule. So one of the ways to overcome that is to put reading time as a regular part of the day at a particular time in the day. Mm -hmm. um, another th the reason why we don't read is that maybe we just don't have an interest in the books or we can't understand the books or maybe we read it once and we feel like, well, just like any other thing that we may come across, I've read it. so. Now what else is needed? But uh, spiritual knowledge is not like that. It's something you can't just read and understand. You have to uh, apply it. You have to try to understand it, try to apply it. Um, also know how to apply it. And also, the memorization that comes from reading needs to be increased by regular reading. The more we read, the more our memory of what we read becomes more clear. So lack of interest due to an inability to understand or just general uh, lackadaisicalness, not seeing the importance of reading. Or, I know what's in the books, I don't have to read. Or, here's even one, another possible uh, reason, is that if I read and I come across things that 
are too hard for me to accept, such as the certain principles of giving up some attachments or some surrender, I become a little bit fearful of the consequences of reading. So I might avoid reading for that. I don't want to change my life. I'm attached to what I do, when I do it, or why I do it. And this reading might, you know, destroy my attachments. Another reason why we probably don't read is maybe because we don't have enough association of devotees who are readers and who can inspire others to read. Or in our modern day age, everything is more visual nowadays. Just sitting and reading in books, it seems to be something that is a thing of the past, a little bit antiquated. Uh, it's easier to turn on a video and watch something, hear something. <clears throat> or maybe we don't have faith in the books. We, maybe we just realize that they're important, but our faith is not strong enough. Therefore, we don't read. And the other thing is maybe we just have other reading material that we're reading, and then we just don't have time for Prabhupada's books. So I listed a few possible readings. I think the one that's most prominent is that devotees feel they don't have time. The idea when you feel you don't have time is just really a feeling. It's just a matter of making time. Uh, making time means understanding the importance of reading. When the importance becomes clear, then making time becomes a uh, priority. And that's probably one of the reasons why we don't read is we just don't know the importance of reading. Or sometimes we might think, well, I'm not so philosophically inclined. I'm more inclined to do things instead of sitting down and reading books. Still, there should be some a means to take in regularly Srila Prabhupada's words, either in the form of reading or listening directly to his lectures. But reading the books has a certain element to it, which allows you to focus, which allows you to think about what you're reading, which allows you to reflect back and read it again in order to get a clearer understanding of what you're reading. It also gives you a chance to sit down and write some notes based on your reading. Like that. Okay, so these are some of the possible reasons why we don't read. Um, we can also um, Yeah, and then of course, maybe another one is that there are, we have Facebook, we have internet, we have our computers, we have our TVs, we have our Instagram, we have whatever else we have. And so and we have our cell phones. We are more electronically focused than sitting down and reading. Or another thing is when I'm reading, I have a hard time to focus because of my lack of understanding and therefore I lose enthusiasm. Or maybe I think, wow, when I pick up the book, the book is so big, I get overwhelmed by the size of the book. <laughs> These are another, some of the other things. Um, lack of faith. These are, this is something else. Or when you come across things you don't understand, you, you might have doubts, and therefore you're not inspired to read more. 
or we just don't have an atmosphere where we can quietly read. When we have children running around or we have household duties to do or we're working, we just don't put time in for reading or the atmosphere is not conducive. Uh, we might also think, well, when I read, I forget everything. Why should I read? So these are some more we can add to the list of some of the reasons why we don't read. And there are more. There's so many more. It's, oh, it's, there's so many reasons not to do something, and there's always one good reason to do it. That one good reason is that we stay connected with Prabhupada. Staying connected with Prabhupada means to stay connected with Prabhupada's movement, and that means staying connected to Krishna. This Krishna Prabhupada is teaching how we can connect with Krishna. And as the founder Acharya, he establishes principles. Another founder Acharya or another uh, spiritual master may present spirituality in a different way. So therefore, we need to stay connected to our founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada. And as Prabhupada said, my books will be the law books for the next 10,000 years. In other words, when we need to know anything on any subject related to Krishna consciousness, even some material principles, Prabhupada covered a lot of that too. It's all in Prabhupada's books <laughs> or his lectures like that. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to see if there's any comments or questions why we don't read the books. So we need devotees to come forward and speak a little bit. This is a very essential principle in our practice of Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Bhakti? Yes, very much. Okay. Um, last night we um, did a virtual installation of the Srimad Bhagavatam set for some of our uh, friends. We lost we lost your volume somehow. Sorry, is that is that better? That's it. Um, last night we did a virtual Srimad Bhagavatam installation for some friends for Bhadra Purnima. And they were asking about, um, you know, we've all heard that analogy of like the Srimad Bhagavatam is like Krishna's body and the first canto is like his feet and the 10th canto is his smiling face. Uh -huh. The 12th canto is the tip of his head. Um, they were, we, we were telling them about that and they were asking more questions about why that is and how that makes sense. Is there anything that you can say on that to kind of elaborate? Um, I don't have my library here, but Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is the one that originally brought that yeah, to everyone's attention. He made that analogy, but the statement in the Shastra is that when Krishna left the planet, he left himself in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. And so that's in the very beginning of the first canto of Bhagavatam which answers the question, well, now that Krishna has left the planet, where will religious principles be found? And the answer is in Srimad Bhagavatam. So Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of Krishna. Being an incarnation, it is, it is non-different than Krishna, but it presents itself in a literary way. So that uh, physical... Uh, analogy that's being uh, expressed or, or taught helps us to understand that when you approach 
the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you approach from the lotus feet. And Srila Prabhupada said, reading Bhagavatam is best done by a systematic study of Bhagavatam, starting from the first canto and moving forward in that way. And uh, so, yeah, the two feet, actually first and second canto are the two feet, and then the, the uh, what is it, what's next is the ankles and then the thighs, the waist, the chest, like that. And then as you said and correctly, the 10th canto is the smiling met face of Krishna. So just to give a more visual uh, analogy of Bhagavatam being non-different than Krishna, the Acharyas have presented this, this uh, description using Krishna's body, which is not some, something imaginary, but it actually corresponds to the actual uh, philosophy of the, of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And each of the cantos represents a particular topic within the, the Bhagavatam, but all of the Bhagavatam contains all of the topics in a general sense, but each of the different cantos emphasize a particular, just like the first canto is more like, um, what is it? Um, the second canto is an introduction to Bhagavatam. The first canto is more like a preliminary introduction. So the first two, although all the philosophy is found in the first two cantos, still it's presenting itself. The actual Bhagavatam philosophical teachings, according to the 10 topics that are mentioned, there, that's mentioned in the Bhagavatam, one of the 10 subject matters that Bhagavatam deals with, starts really from the third canto. So again, it's like darshan. Darshan means you start with the lotus feet, you gradually bring the, the vision up the transcendental body of the Lord to the smiling face of the Lord, and then back down to his lotus feet, and then you offer your obeisances. So we can offer obeisances to Srimad Bhagavatam because it's not different than Krishna. So I have here, let me see. <coughs> and it says here, this is a prayer by Sanatana Goswami. And he's glorifying Srimad Bhagavatam. He speaks to Srimad Bhagavatam. He says, O Srimad Bhagavatam, O nectar churned from the ocean of all Vedic scriptures, O most prominent transcendental fruit of all the Vedas, O you who are enriched with the jewels of all spiritual philosophical conclusions, O you who grant spiritual vision to all the people of the world, O life breath of the Vaishnava devotees, O Lord, you are the sun which has arisen to dispel the darkness of the Kali Yuga. You are actually Krishna himself who has returned among us. And there's three more prayers, but that one illustrates Krishna being now different than Bhagavatam. So that's by Sanatana Goswami. Thank you, Garmaj. Um, he was, if it's okay, one more question that he had that I would love to hear your answer to, if that's okay. Yeah, did that answer clear up the first question? It did, yeah, it was great. Um, we also read that prayer last night. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, Gurma, she was also asking, why are we not hearing only the conversation between Shukadev Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj? Why are we also hearing Sutta Goswami's commentary? And what is what is the unique kind of value that he adds to the narrative? You have to understand, Bhagavatam is a, is a narration of a narration of a narration. So throughout the Bhagavatam, there's different personalities discussing Bhagavatam 
but it always goes back to Sukadev Goswami, who's giving the overview of all the other narrations. So he starts off with the discussion at Nami Sharanya, which sets the stage for understanding the main principles of Bhagavatam. And the sages ask six questions, and then they're answered by Sukadev Goswami in his discussion with Maharaj Pariksit. And then you'll see there's discussions on, with other great personalities. Um, Narada Muni speaks a lot to King Yudhisthira. But then again, as, as that narration goes on, Sukadev Goswami is narrating that narration. So there's at least three, three to four narrations that go on like that. The original narration is Sukadev Goswami like that. And the original uh, seed of, of that narration is the meeting with Nami Sharanya at the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Even Krishna speaks in Bhagavatam. In Bhagavatam. There are many, many speakers, there are many, many dialogues going on all in that, but Sukadev Goswami is narrating the narrations, that's all. Thank you very much. Is that clear? Yeah, it's nice. Um, we, we were saying yesterday that, you know, sometimes if, if we have to give a class or something, sometimes we'll listen to a lecture of yours or a lecture of Radhana Swami's or something, and when we then give the class and we refer to you, then there's some additional love and respect for the speaker um, that might also be coming out in Sutta Goswami's narrations as well of the conversation by Shukadev Goswami. So yeah, he, that was he, yeah, he remains chaste to actually what is happening. He doesn't say this is this is all his narration. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Um, Maharaj, I, I see one question on chat. Uh, Jahanava Mataji is asking. Is it related to, to our conversation? Uh, no, Guru Maharaj, it's a different one. Okay, let's skip it for now. Okay. Um, let's stick on the subject matter. <laughs> Maharaj, this is Amrita. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of audio books out there. And um, uh, so I, f I actually find it a lot easier to listen to the audiobook while I'm reading. So is that the same as reading? Um, well, you're getting the same knowledge, but the medium also affects how the knowledge is being received. Um, there, is a, there is advantage to directly hearing the word spoken, and there's also direct there is advantage from sitting down and reading the books. I think we mentioned sitting down and reading gives you a chance to reflect, write down notes, to go back. Um, hearing the sound vibration from the speaker is the advantage in the audio because the words are coming from a person and a person is also connecting their realizations and emotions with the words so that and that's inspirational when it's done and when that speaker is very devotional mm. so yeah there's advantages in both so if you're looking for one over the other um it's uh i won't i won't put myself in a situation where i'll say one is better than the other because i do both mm. I do is this a Keshabhati Maharaj is actually doing audio kind of um, reading every single day. 
And um, what I find is that when I listen to that and stop and start and make notes, it, it really helps rather than just me reading it on my own. Yeah, well, if that's an advantage and you find it, you find it so, then good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By, um, Keshe Babarti Maharaj is actually one of, was the person who came up with the program of uh, 41, 41 pages per day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's, there's nothing less about that. <laughs> But I would also suggest mm -hmm. that from time to time, just pick up, pick up the book and read. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that may not be your main way, main way, but you'll see that there is a, there is something there that you'll find that's a little different from hearing directly. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Krishna very much. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your lotus feet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a dumb question to ask, Guru Maharaj. Uh, what kind of question? Dumb. <laughs> really basic, obvious um, answer question. Uh, I don't think you know, dumb questions are not allowed. Therefore, uh, I think your question is not so much dumb, but it's just uh, you know, you're just being humble. So go ahead. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, <clears throat> Um, you know, In other religions, they always seem to follow one book, like the Christians, the uh, Muslim culture, and so on. <clears throat> I know that in one of the Prabhupada's lectures, he's always emphasized the topmost book is Bhagavatam. But then, why did Prabhupada decide to give us five books to follow? Four. Isn't this potentially a difficulty for us because we're other cultures obviously just have one book and they just focus on that? We have four, not five. Four. I'm sorry. Four, four main ones. There's a, and that is a preliminary understanding of the practice and the knowledge of transcendence is given by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Where that ends is where Bhagavatam begins. So it's actually sequential. Krishna doesn't speak about his pastimes in the Bhagavad Gita at all. He simply speaks about who, what is the living entity in the material world? What is that relationship with the living entity, with the, with the Supreme? Who is the Supreme? What is this material energy? What is the time factor? And what are the results of one's activities? These are the essential subjects of Bhagavad Gita, which is preliminary knowledge of the practice of Krishna consciousness, which help, which establishes Sambandha. So the Vedas are described, are divided into three categories, Sambandha, Abhideya and Prayojana. Sambandha means relationship. That means what is our relationship with Krishna? What is our relationship with each other? What is our relationship with Guru? What is our relationship with different devotees on different levels? Relationships, because this world is all about relationships. We have relationships with our wife, that's one way, with our children, that's another way, with our boss, that's another way, with our personal possessions, that's another way, with our mind, that's another way. 
So relationship establishes the principle of activity. And activity is the next stage, which is abhideya. Abhideya means the process of bhakti. Once some bandha is clear, then abhideya becomes more easily practiced and understood. When you, only, when you know your relationship with everything, at least you have a, a preliminary understanding, then you can function, then you can execute devotional service nicely. And by proper execution of devotional service through the principles of Sambandha and Abhideya, you can reach the goal, which is Prayojana. Prayojana means the goal of all activities, and that is the love of God. So although other religions or other religious faiths emphasize a particular book, we emphasize a system of knowledge which spans itself throughout different scriptures. And that system is uh, what we say step by step. And therefore, and this like, now Nectar Devotion is one of the four books. So what is Nectar Devotion? Nectar Devotion is the handbook for the execution of devotional service. How does devotional service work? The intricacies of that working. That's nectar devotion. And the other book is Chaitanya Charitamrita, and that's the life and teachings of Lord Chaitanya, which are the Muga Vrindavan exhibited by Krishna in, the, in his mood as Radharani's love for Krishna, which takes you into the mood of Vrindavan. So these four books all together comprise the essential teachings and not, not, I'm sorry, not essential, complete teachings of the practice of pure devotional service. Everything is there in those four books. And so they're systematic, they're correlative to, they, they correlate with each other and there's two things. One is called um, Shmiti and one is called Shruti. Shruti means, well, actually, to be more to be more specific, there is knowledge coming from Krishna directly, and there's knowledge about Krishna coming from the great sages and saints. So Bhagavatam is mostly knowledge coming from Krishna. Bhagavatam is a combination of both, which mostly coming about Krishna. Nectar devotion is the science of the interaction with the living entity with Krishna and how it is successfully performed. And uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita is living Bhagavatam. It's the life of the Lord himself. So, um, the, the Vedas are, are vast, and to relegate to one particular book and say that's all. And Prabhupada said, if you simply st study and read Nectar, I'm sorry, um, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, then everything is there in those two books. Mm. And that explains the, the richness and the completeness of what Prabhupada has left behind for us. Yeah, it's, um, it's not it. just many other scriptures. They don't go into the relationship between the Jiva and the Lord. They give that relationship in a very generic and very simplified that God is the father and we are his children. God is the master and we are his servant. God is the con controller and we are the control. They give the general principles of relationship without the intricacy of that relationship, which is there in, in Bhagavatam and in Chaitanya Charitamrita especially. Yeah. Yes, for example, I mean, thou shalt not kill. There's so many interpretations everybody makes. 
and there's no definition whereas in our scriptures we define things like that very clearly and precisely interpretation is there when you when there's no under when the, when things are unclear when there's clarity there's no need for interpretation and that's why the Vedic scriptures, especially the ones that Prabhupada gave us, are clear. Interpretation means I don't know, and so I'm giving my own ideas and based on what I, am, I read and understand. Yeah. Prabhupada said they're all rascals when they say, I think. Well, I think means, you know, it starts with me and ends with me. Mm. It actually starts from this. This knowledge is there's two aspects to this knowledge. It's called uh, aroha panta and avaroha panta. One is going up and the other one's coming down. Transcendental knowledge, in its pure form, is avaroha panta coming down. That means higher knowledge is given to us from the perfect source. We don't have to speculate, it's all clear. All we have to do is uh, know it and understand it, that's all. The idea I think, or it's like this, means that uh, you become the center and you're the authority. <laughs> And that's just cheating. We can think about how things are presented to us in order for us to understand it. That's there. You can use your understanding, intelligence to understand, but everything is clear. You may read something and you might not be able to completely understand it simply by reading it. But that the idea is to use your intelligence to understand it. That's all. Mm. Not like, well, that's that's your opinion, and then I have my opinion. Mm. I was listening to Prabhupada today, and he was talking about people have their ideas of God, but God is not subjected to anybody's ideas. God is God. <laughs> your idea doesn't make God right. Yeah. Yeah. I have my idea that the sun rises in the west, but that's just my idea. Because it's my idea, I think I'm right. <laughs> the absolute truth is what it is. And to know it, you have to hear from the, from the perfect authorities. Thank you for clarifying. Very nice lecture. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, my humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to yourself. Hare Krishna. So we, in our Sangha group, we started reading um, Prabhupada by Swatsarupa Goswami, also to reconnect us back to Srila Prabhupada. So we've gone back to the very beginning and it's lovely reading about Prabhupada's time in America again. But... Uh, uh, we also have newcomers, and my question is, uh, the newcomers sometimes get um, overwhelmed and feel they, can't, they won't be able to meet Sri Prabhupada's um, views on how he was preaching, they won't be as good as Sri Prabhupada. How do we then um, just tell them that it's, it's not being afraid to be in the movement? Because sometimes they say, oh, he was just a sannyasi, that's too great for us. How can, how can we engage them? Do we, at this point, tell them to chant or read another book? What would you suggest, Maharaj, how we can approach this? Well, we, have, we have to be very specific about what is their uh, problem. If they're a newcomer, you just expose them to the basic philosophy and chat and hear and uh, ask your questions. 
if if they have questions we should be able to deal with their questions and have the answers but if they have their own opinions and want to put their own opinions forward then it has no place really so uh, when somebody is coming in to learn something it's not that we accept their opinions as just as good as everything else they're it's like if you go to a classroom and you sit down and hear the teacher and you're new to the subject you might have read something or heard something about the subject but who cares about what you think you have to learn from the teacher that's why you're there so ultimately we can try to answer their questions without patronizing their ideas you, know. you say you know it takes time to understand this knowledge just keep reading keep practicing ask questions and we're here to help you i mean they're fascinated by that book Prabhupada, because of such oh, greatness yeah. in determination and they talk about this determination of Sri Prabhupada but sometimes I feel they're still fearful whether they can match being in the movement so at this stage do we introduce chanting or do well, we not? Chanting should be there at the very beginning yeah yeah I would yeah yeah you know, Prabhupada came to spread the chanting of the holy name. So that's his main teaching. So and it's our main practice. So we also encourage everyone to come in and to, in a turn order to understand more about our practice and philosophy. Here is the process. You can chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Yeah. Yeah. So I think if you're going to have any kind of gathering, if you don't include some form of chanting, either japa together or kirtan, your, your group, your meeting is incomplete. That's also mentioned that all, every gathering should have the chanting of the holy name. Yes, we have Kirtan, we have Japa. We actually have Japa in our Sangha, even online. We chant together. But sometimes I feel that they think, um, I know we're not supposed to be oh. comparing ourselves to Sri Prabhupada, but they feel they won't be good enough, if that makes sense, to be in the movement. Um, I mean, they're keen, they're interested. I don't know what's the fine line here. It's not a matter. It's a matter not matter of being in the movement. Just let them come in here and chant. That's all. There's no. We're not putting any restrictions on anybody or any rules on anybody. Just come and just come in here. That's all. Anybody can do that. There's no expectations. If you're like trying to. Uh, set a series of expectations on the, on the newcomers, then you're going to defeat your whole program. Just let them come in here and if they have questions, let them ask. And which book should we introduce first then, Maharaj, Sri Prabhupada's book? Well, I would say Science of Self-Realization is a nice start. For newcomers. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else? Hey, Bob Maharaj, may I please ask one more question? Please. Gurmaj, at the Bhakti Center, we have these community groups that are geared primarily towards um, new-ish devotees. Most of them are chanting maybe four rounds or so a day, but still very new to the Shastra. And um, there is a series of books called Brilliant as the Sun by Krishna Dharma Prabhu that oh, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so my co-facilitator recommended we use that in, in our upcoming group. Just wanted to check with you in terms of how you feel about using these kinds of circles um, to read books that are not necessarily Prabhupada's books, but hopefully will lead people there. Well, that's, that's more like a, a uh, how can I, what's the proper word? It's more like a uh, way to present Bhagavatam in a more readable type of form for the, for the average reader. Um, he, he, he uses what they call writer's privileges and he adds a few things in there to make the storyline interesting. He doesn't change the storyline, but he uses embellishments in the storyline to make it more exciting. It's just like when you make a movie about the life of someone. You might add a few other things just to glamorize the whole topic, the whole presentation. So he does that, but he doesn't really change anything. He's presenting Bhagavatam in a, in a, just in a, in a readable form, that's all. I find those books quite good, and Krishna Dharma is one of the best writers, I think, in our movement. He has a way to present words that are, you, you're captivated by his presentations. You might say he has a way with words, he's good. And that's brought out when you read his Ramayan or his presentation on the Mahabharata. He actually, when he started putting that out, he, he, he came to me with the first volume and he asked me to reread it and give my input. And I did, and I actually made a few changes or I suggested a few changes on the first book that he put out and he accepted those changes. Um, so he wants to just present it for the average Joe, you know, so who don't really, can't really sit down and read, you know, Sanskrit or transliterations or, you know, Devanagari or very, you know, organized type of religious book. He is just making it in readable form, that's all. I think he did a good job. I didn't haven't read the later ones, but I have read the first two volumes that he presented. Yeah, I think the at least what I saw on Amazon, I think he's only done up to um, Kento three parts one and two. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And that's been out for a while. It seems like he stopped for some reason. Yeah, Kento uh, four is. Um, I'm just wondering how much, the reason why he stops maybe is how much the sales of his books are actually going. Uh, I don't, he's not so good at promoting his own books, that's the problem. Somebody needs to promote those books because they're actually quite nice, they're very, quite good. Thank you, Garmesh. Mm -hmm. uh, Brilliant at the Sun by Krishna Dharma. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Our glory is to Srila Prabhupada and our glory is to you. Uh, I I was thinking uh, about asking you uh, the the way how I read because uh, I just realized that uh, it may not be the best uh, because I I I don't really have so much patience and I I really think I'm not really uh, in the mood of goodness and I just uh, used to, when I I'm reading I used to skip the uh, the original verses and uh, I mean the Sanskrit. Uh, and uh, also when I start to read Bhagavatam, the preface and things like this. Uh, so just focusing on the, on the translation and on the purports of the verses itself, itself yeah. 
and uh, is it uh, is it something which I should uh, really change, or is it? Uh, you mean I'm not you sure should? You mean you should read the? Uh, you're asking whether you should read the Sanskrit or not? Uh, yeah. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Sanskrit. Mm. I was just today listening to Prabhupada chanting verses from the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's just like melody, these verses. Sweetness. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you have your preference, and if you find it too difficult, if you think, well, I'm not going to read if I have to read the Sanskrit, then, 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 read, then read it without it. <laughs> No, it's, um, I mean, I, I can do it. It's just, uh, it may be a bit more difficult. You get into it, you really like it. Mm -hmm. You actually start trying to perfect it after a while. Mm -hmm. When you read it, you see you made a little bit of a pronunciation error, you'll go back over and do it again. Mm -hmm. It's nice. I love it. Personally, I really loved it the whole. So if you ask me, I would say, go for it. Okay, but I will yeah, try it. It's my advice. It's not a. It's not like an absolute principle. I'm just talking from my own experience, and experience of the many devotees like that. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. Hey, Janavar, are you still there? Yes, but Maharaj is there. Okay, so she's asking, uh, you want to write a review for a monthly magazine on one of Jiva Goswami's books? Can you advise me to write on Hari Namrita Vikaranam? I would, or, or another book? Yeah, I would pick another book. I would say uh, write on Tattva Sandarva, which is very, it's not a very big book, but it's the foundation for understanding uh, the whole philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Tattva Sandarva. Uh, there's two translations by Kushakrata, and there's one by Banu Swami. I, uh, either one is good, but I recommend Banu Swami's translation. That's Tattva Sandarva. Tattva, T A T T B A Sandarva. Uh, Hare Namrita Vikaranam. I'm not sure of that particular book. And. Uh, it sounds a little bit uh, uh, deep. So for a monthly magazine, maybe Tattva Sandarva might be better. That's it. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Let's see. Well, actually, I have to leave because I have a meeting coming up in, a, in less than 15 minutes. So, um, so we'll stop here. Tomorrow we'll begin a systematic reading of uh, a presentation. We'll take it day by day in a systematic way like that. Thank you very much. We'll see you all tomorrow. Please come for more about the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books. Hare Krishna, thank you, Maharaj. Very good.